Hey, welcome to Gold Derby. I'm Christopher Rosen. I'm joined by Haley Steinfeld, the star and executive producer of Dickinson, the second season of which uh, is available now on Apple TV+. Plus. It premiered earlier this year. I actually wanted to start there with you, Haley. Uh, what did you learn about playing Emily Dickinson in season one that you were excited to maybe explore further in this season two? Ooh, well, anything and everything. I had come across her poetry in school, but I really didn't know much about her. So um, all of the discoveries that I made about her in season one, I was just, of course, excited to be in the TV space and have the opportunity uh, that I have never had before and going back and really digging a little deeper into this into this character, into the family dynamic and into the space and world that she lives in um, with her poetry being the foundation of all of that, right? She didn't move around much. She didn't leave her uh, well, she didn't leave her room, let alone her house uh, at all, really. So um, getting into her mind and, and that crazy imagination of hers, right? What's so exciting about this show is we take these poems that are four lines, sometimes less, sometimes just a few more, and, and we dig into what, what writing these specific poems might have looked like. Um, and that allows me to take a ride in Death's Carriage and find myself at an opera and um, going through all of these incredible, uh, what end up being these really amazing episodes, uh, which is has been such a dream. But um, I think I was most excited about going into season two, having won the right to become a writer in season one being able to comfortably talk about my poetry and publishing my poetry and being a writer in front of my family um, and going into a completely different headspace of whether or not I want to then be published uh, and, and kind of diving into this world of like celebrity culture and this outburst of technology uh, that, that, that we see in season two. Um, I, was, I was excited to sort of dig into that. Yeah, I mean, like that, is, I think, is a really uh, interesting part about this season. Obviously, so much of it is about, you know, that fame, for lack of a better word, like you said, celebrity culture and like kind of like, I guess, Emily's pursuit of that. And then also the repercussions that come from, you know, that kind of public recognition. Obviously, you are you're an actress. You've been you know, famous uh, for a while, I guess. How much of your own experience were you able to bring to that arc uh, as, you know, the season progressed? So I'll say that, you know, I had a, a, I don't know if difficult is, is necessarily the word. I guess at times a difficult time understanding where Emily was in season two. And, and I realized once it was over, if only I'd realized it sooner, um, that it was because I was sort of close to it. And, and the headspace that she was in, in just solely trying to figure out what fame is and what it means. It's not something I, Haley, have really put much thought into. Um, I consider my relationship to fame healthy. Um, it's never been, it's always been about the work for me. So anything that kind of comes along with it is just a, a, a bonus, um, I'd consider. So I had to think a lot about what she was thinking. And because I didn't have the answers, I felt a little bit lost, but she was, right? So I guess it worked. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was, um, just digging into, to finding what, what, again, what it means and where, where I was at. And, and as far as in terms of bringing my own personal experience, I think it was just being in a very similar headspace that she was in, that I was able to kind of, you know, share with yeah, her. You, yeah. You mentioned like your relationship with fame is pretty healthy. I guess, like, was there anything that you did it, this, like playing her and going through these things, like, did it help you? Did it? Did you recontextualize or even like reconsider certain things that maybe you hadn't thought about, about being a, a famous person, I guess, I, I, for lack of a better word, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that in specifically in episode uh, six, which is Split the Lark, um, there's a conversation that Emily has with the opera star, Adelaide May, and and it's a really heartbreaking conversation that they have. Um, and I found it to be just that personally, because, you know, it wasn't until again, there were moments during this season that I had these, these realizations and these little, um, you know, discoveries that made me um, either think or question or, uh, you know, become more aware of what fame might be, right? Or is, uh, and in that conversation, 
Emily goes from being so incredibly moved by this performance, by this person, by her voice, by her movement, everything about her. And when she hears her say, she looks her in the eye and just says, what city are we in? What time is it? Where are we? I, this was, that was just an act. That was just a, a, a performance. You know, it's, it's no different than it was last time. It's no different than it'll be tomorrow. And there was a crazy moment where I was just like, this is, it can get to that point, right? Where you're going, 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 and you don't even know where you are anymore. You don't know what time zone you're in. And, and it's, it's a scary thing because you can get wrapped up in it. You can kind of lose sight of the goal. You can lose sight of your happiness, of who you are. Um, and that's a thing that happens. And, and, and I, I thankfully have an incredible family and team of people that kind of keep me on track, but that, that I've, 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 my head has wandered. My, my, you know, mind has wandered into those spaces of just being so mentally exhausted that you don't really know, you know, you just lose sight. Um, but it was that, it wasn't until that conversation happened, that scene happened that I kind of had that, that, you know, those thoughts. Yeah. The other episode I really, I mean, I love the whole season, honestly, but the other episode I want to talk a little about was episode eight. I found that one uh, really great. I think it's, I'm nobody. Um, hmm. you're, you know, Emily is, uh, <laughs> you're, you're invisible throughout that episode. I, I think just from a technical standpoint, I was so impressed with how you're like, not your, the characters are not seeing you. And I guess, hmm. can you talk a little about the logistics of just even executing that? Cause I felt like that was like really well, uh, really well done and performed it's like but obviously like you know it's a practical thing it's not like a visual effect so like can you right. talk a little about that uh doing sure. those scenes yeah the, the first scene we shot of that episode was the scene where I come down to the dining room and Lavinia and Mrs. Dickinson are in there and I um we had not shot any other part of the episode yet and that was the beginning of it so it was truly a moment of it was a much longer rehearsal than than, than normal um because we were trying to figure out from a sound perspective, the overlap, like how is this not gonna totally screw us over? Um, and just from a you know practical standpoint of like these two people are having a conversation and they're distracted by the fact that I'm here and I'm like chiming in and pitching in and um, you know trying to get their attention when they just, it, it was a very strange thing and it took us a minute to figure out, but when we did, we were smooth sailing. Uh, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a weird thing to, first of all, imagine, right? Like. I guess there have been times where, I mean, for instance, this show comes out, I would love to be a fly on the wall in, in a screening room, right? Hear what people are saying. But then it's like, do you really? Because it's not all going to be great. And, and Emily goes through these harsh realizations of, you know, what she's asking for, or what she thinks she wants might not be after all. Um, but that was a fun episode. Shoot. Yeah. And you mentioned like, I mean, the heartbreak, I felt like the other, like your uh, Emily's relationship with Sam, I felt like was also like really, I just really enjoyed, I thought, maybe enjoy is not the right word, but I really appreciated like you and Finn playing off each other so well, but mm -hmm. also like the idea that, you know, she kind of falls for him because he shows an interest in her work and then the kind of that getting, that rug getting pulled out from under her, I thought that was really heartbreaking. And I think we, you kind of really expressed that so well in the performance. I guess, can you talk a little about like how you, like, you know, how you thought about those scenes towards the end of the season, especially in like, you know, maybe working with, with Finn on those in the, in those scenes, I guess, I thought they were really good. Yeah, thank you so much. I Finn is wonderful. He, uh, I always love, um, now that we're three seasons into this show, when we have guest stars come on and, and you get to see these people just come into this world that is already established and they have to kind of jump right in or it's a, it's a moving train. And if they don't jump on, then they're, you know, hanging on for dear life. And, and it's so amazing to see these actors come in and just like, hold their own, come in, bring a new fresh perspective to the show and a new energy. And it's, it's something Finn did so incredibly well. And he really came into the thick of it and um, brought so much intrigue and mystery to this character that made it so desirable for Emily. Um, there was something about him that she couldn't figure out and she was going to make it her goal to do so. Right. And, you know, the intentions were, in question from both, from everyone involved, Sue, Sam, Emily, um, Sue towards Emily and vice versa. And to say it's all, it's a big triangle. Um, but it was amazing to play through those scenes because I think with Emily being introduced to this person by the one person that she absolutely trusts and loves and, and understands and, and who sees her for who she is. She couldn't possibly feel like Sue would ever do anything to spite her. Right. So she falls into the lap of this, of this man who 
paints this picture of a, of a glamorous world of what publishing her poetry might be like. And, and he paints this picture of, you know, if you want, if you want to do this, I can do this for you. And it's, it, you can't do this without me. And so Emily is so intrigued by it until, and like you said, it gets sort of ripped out from under her and she falls for this, this, this person and the idea of this person and what this person has to offer. Um, and that happens, that happens a lot, right? I mean, there's a, there's a manipulation and, um, a sense of, you know, people being promising when they're when they're not necessarily, and and there are more than one obstacles as far as what she's trying to overcome with this one person. Uh, but I love Finn, like I said, and he was so awesome to to play through those scenes with. And then you mentioned Sue. I mean, obviously, the season ends with uh, you know M and Sue kind of like reaching a new stage of their uh, probably relationship. And like, you're like, I think you mentioned this earlier, but like, they're not really on the same page throughout most of the season, mm. I guess for season three, um, you know, like, what are like, what are your expectations there, I guess. And like, what are, what are you guys talking about for what you're hoping to do in the next season? Well, we are very much in the middle of it. <laughs> um, and, oh, what can I say? <laughs> I'll say that, you know, with ending season two, with these two characters, promising themselves to each other, right? And they have all along, although life has absolutely gotten in the way. And this is somebody, Sue is her best friend, her lover, her sister-in-law, her muse, mentor. There are so many different roles that she play, that they play for each other, um, that they continue to do so as, as season three goes on, uh, as the show goes on. So it's been wonderful just to be able to come back and have the opportunity once again to get into the, you know, get into a new dynamic, a new, uh, a new Dickinson, you know, it's, a, it's, we're at a different point in all of their lives and um, it's going to be a fun one, I'll say. Yeah, I'm excited for it. We're talking today, the Oscars are tomorrow. Uh, so I, we're here at Gold Derby. I have to ask you about your Oscar nomination. It was 10 years ago. I was looking at it. So that's a, since I remember it like it was yesterday. I was, I was I'm sure you did too, I guess. I was, but yes. I was wondering like, you know, I, I read an interview, I think, with you at the time where you were like, oh, it was like a dream come true to get nominated for True Grit. Obviously, if people are watching this, they don't know. I can't imagine they don't, but nominated Best Scoring Actress, one of the youngest nominees ever. I guess, has your, how has your perception of the nomination or thoughts about it evolved, I guess, in the last 10 years as you've kind mm. of grown up and like gotten, you know, become more of an adult and stuff, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Well, I, I will say, you know, when I, when I got nominated, I... I was very young. Um, I had just finished my first movie. I all like I, we shot the thing and it came out and we ran the press for all of the awards circuit in one year. I mean, it was just it was a whirlwind, to say the least. And I. I remember two things very vividly. I didn't know when the nominations were being announced. I didn't know the date. I didn't know when it was happening. My, my team was very great about now looking back. They were really good at like not making it a, a thing. Um, and this, sorry if this is long-winded, but I'm, I'm yeah. thinking about it now and all of these memories are coming back. Um, but I, I do remember overhearing a conversation my, my mom had gotten a call saying that they wanted me to go into town and stay at a, at a hotel. Should I be nominated? I can wake up the next morning and do press. Right. And my mom was like, absolutely not. What do I tell her when it doesn't happen? And we're at that hotel and we have to drive home. Right. And, and I was like, well, thank God that happened. Right. And then sure enough, the next morning, the announcement was made first thing. And I, again, still didn't know it was coming. So it came as a tremendous surprise and, and what an incredible one. Um, and I got there and one of the first sort of interviews that I did, somebody had said to me, uh, do you know that your title has forever changed? And I truly did not understand what they meant. I, I absolutely did that thing that I did in 90% of my interviews when I was 14, where I just was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and I acted like I knew what they were talking about when I didn't. And, um, and obviously shortly after I knew what she was talking about. And I will say it's an absolute honor at the highest honor um but i'll say after shooting this season season two of dickinson um i do think i i have realized more that and i'll say sorry too that that during that time i made this movie with people who who do it for the the art and for the work and to better themselves as artists and and to make a great piece of 
cinema um, for no other reason. And, and it just so happens to be that they're so damn good that it happens every time they make a film. Um, but it wasn't, it was never a thing to me that it was like, this is something you have to be, this is the goal here, right? We got to get nominated for at least this amount, or you have to do this or whatever. It was never part of a conversation and it was never anything that I felt pressured uh, about or stressed about. Um, but I think now having gone 10 years uh, since then and, and, having continued to work with incredible people, I've, I've realized that it's still about the work. It's still about going every day and being the best performer and learning and asking questions and never um, being a, afraid to ask questions or, or be ashamed of not knowing the answers. I think I'm, I'm just getting started. I, I, I do remember it like it was yesterday. I can't believe it's been 10 years, but um, I, I, I'm so grateful to be in a place where my work is being recognized because here I'm playing a character who in her lifetime wasn't. And uh, I, I am incredibly, incredibly grateful for the, for that, for that honor. It's a, it's a real privilege to, to be in this position um, to have a voice and to have a platform. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's my, my take on it hasn't altered in that I do still ver feel very strongly that it's, it's, it's the work for me. It's about the work. The last thing here before we wrap up, and I know we have to go. You mentioned like the work, and I was, I mean, I've been thinking of like obviously just prepping for this and like thinking about all this. You're, you've done so many things, I feel like, even since like True Grit, like different genres, different, like, you know, I, obviously you're going to be in Hawkeye, you did the voice in Spider Verse, like Dickinson. I feel like you have done so much comedy, like at just 17. I guess, is there, you know, talking about the art and the work, is there something, uh, what are you excited to do in the next? you know, couple of years uh, that you haven't done? Or is there something like, you know, from as an actress that you're like, you know, like really excited to try like either a genre of film or something like that? Because I just feel like you're so, my impression of you is that you're really versatile and like you're able to do just a lot of different things really, really well. And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of rare. So I guess like, what are you hoping to do next? Or is it just going to be more, ho will you have more, uh, you know, Hawkeye or Dickinson season four, hopefully, or whatever it is? I guess. Maybe, um, <laughs> you know, I have to say, I, I feel so excited about entering a new phase in my life, if that makes sense. Um, as I, as I get older, you know, the roles are naturally changing and um, there's a whole world of roles that I haven't even been introduced to because uh, you know, I, I'm not there yet and I'm getting there and I'm so excited about that. And, and, you know, genre wise, I, never thought I'd be in a Western. And after that, I never thought I would be doing a sci-fi. So it, it, as far as the trajectory in genres, I, I couldn't have dreamt of a better way for all of those to have fallen into place the way they did. Um, so I just can't wait to see what the future holds. I, I, I feel so lucky I get to work with so many incredible filmmakers and writers writers um, that are creating these, these roles. But again, I... I'm looking forward to like this next, the next 10 years. Cause I think a lot, um, a lot is changing uh, in film and television. A lot's changing for me personally. And um, I feel like I'm, you know, growing and improving. And um, I, I, again, feel like I'm, I'm so fired up. I'm just getting started. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to what's, what's coming for me. What's out there. Thanks. Uh, Haley Steinfeld, the star of Dickinson, season two is on Apple TV+. Plus. Thank you so much, Haley, for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Christopher. Thank you. See you soon.